In the movie Cooties, we get to witness the ultimate culmination of all of man's technological prowess accompanied with our need to consume meat. Known as pink slime, it's protein paste in its most basic form and is used to make everything from chicken patties to chicken nuggets to anything that is chicken based that doesn't look like an actual chicken. Actually, new market idea, mold pink slime into the actual shape of a chicken. Anyhow, this pink slime is quite edible and is actually pretty delicious. But like with a lot of farms, unfortunately, when you get that many animals together in one area, Area, you typically start to have some issues with opportunistic infections. Viruses, bacteria, fungi, whatever it is, it will spread like wildfire amongst the population when it reaches a certain size and density. Sort of where humanity finds itself currently with a specific disease. In cooties, however, what originally infects the chickens is able to jump the species barrier and then infect Homo sapiens. Upon doing so, it will render children infected as bloodthirsty, ravenous animals whose only purpose is to infect more children and consume adults. Adults infected display very different symptoms, however. So in today's episode, we will discuss exactly what is happening concerning this illness and why whoever made this movie massively did their research into the actual virology associated with their thinking. I'm actually pretty impressed. All right, let's get to it. But first, you gotta know that today's episode is sponsored by Raycon. Wow, what a year 2021 is already turning out to be. And because of that, there's nothing better than tuning it out. And that's never been easier than with the everyday E25 earbuds from Raycon. If you want a great pair of earbuds with noise isolating abilities, deep bass, six hours of playtime and clear music then look no further. Personally, I like them because of the noise isolating abilities, so you can really only hear the outside noise if you actually want to hear the outside noise, which is perfect for like at the gym or at home or when your family is screaming over each other. So if you head to the link in the description or go to buyraycon.com forward slash Roanoke, you can get 15% off your order on a pair of earbuds that are already about wow. roughly half the price of others. These affordable music conveyors are fantastic, but if for any reason you do not feel like the earbuds are good or you don't like them, you can always return them for free for 45 days. With that long of a test period, you're sure to enjoy these comfortable and sleek earbuds. So again, head on over to buyraycon.com forward slash Roanoke. Pick yourself up some great wireless earbuds today. All right, let's get back to it. All right, so with that out of the way, per usual, we all know the drill, but for you newbies, you will see a timestamp up on screen. If you want to bypass the summary or want to watch the movie for yourself and don't want it spoiled, head there. For everyone else, let's do a quick summary as to why you might be afraid to eat chicken nuggets, but really, it's good for you. Builds the immune system, as long as you aren't eaten by your children, that is. So we open up our story with a bunch of chickens. A man casually walks through before grabbing one and releasing it of its earthly burdens. Presumably, it's harvesting day for the chickens as Big Papa needs some chicken nuggets. We launch into a montage of chicken byproducts being made, and those with weak constitutions may want to look away. One point in particular, however, that I want you to pay attention to is the fly releasing waste on one of the chickens. Eventually, the pink slime is made, but one chicken nugget in particular doesn't appear to be like the rest. With green meat being added into the mix, it is breaded cooked, and then frozen. Sent to a school in Fort Chicken, a little girl eats the chicken nugget, releasing the partially uncooked gooey slime from the interior, kicking off the movie in the right direction. We then meet our protagonist, Clint, a writer who recently moved back into his guest house of his mom's place from New York. He's attempting to write a book in a Christine-esque style, but according to his mother, his writing isn't too relatable, and I can relate to that. In the meantime, while he writes, he's picked up a job as a substitute teacher, and despite it being the summer, some kids are held back, and actually from the looks of it, a lot of kids are held back, and they must attend summer school during the summer. Arriving at the school, he's immediately parked in by another teacher and exits through the back of his car. Finding a nice phrase written there, he begins walking through the playground past the most hostile children I've ever seen in my life. One kid in particular, Patriot, my god what a name, tells his mother to go F herself and then heads inside. As Clint makes his way into the school, he meets with a vice principal who then takes his phone, citing that if the kids can't have it, neither can he. He's directed to his classroom but mentions that he used to actually go there as a kid so he doesn't need directions and then heads to the teacher's lounge. Inside of the teacher's lounge, he meets a guy, Wade, who had double parked him in and immediately they don't jive very well. And then he meets a woman named Lucy that he originally went to school with back in the day when he was a kid. He also meets a man named Doug, which if you haven't seen the meme while such gaming made about this man being me, and I can't really blame him, that's a pretty fairly accurate summation. The other teachers are Rebecca the Burnett and Tracy, who is currently talking about how firm his partner's tennis balls are. Lucy walks Clint into the classroom as well as the rest of the teachers head in, and they all begin their days in various ways to start with their lessons. As Clint enters his classroom, two boys are picking on a little girl who seems to be a little dazed and confused with sores all over her face. As Clint tries to take Patriot's phone, he's threatened, then heads back to his desk to start a lesson plan. Patriot then turns
turns to the little girl and pulls on her hair to get her attention, to which a large patch of scalp comes out. She immediately turns to Patriot and then begins to attack him. As she does, she bites into his face. Clip then breaks up the fight as the little girl runs and Patriot is taken to the nurse's office. The nurse tells him that he needs to go to the hospital to get stitches. While Patriot sits there, he begins to display some glazed expression of his own that the girl had and breathing problems begin to be slightly labored. Apparently the little girl bolted outside at this point and Clint doesn't attempt to find her, which is a little weird. He heads to the teacher's lounge instead while the kids play outside and then begins to talk to Lucy about how the kids are eating each other's faces nonchalantly. And I have to say, this movie reminds me a lot of Shaun of the Dead in this aspect, and I just love how everything is just so matter of fact. It's just great. As Lucy and Clint talk, Dink then runs over to the little girl to confront her. It's a bold strategy, Cotton. Let's see how horribly this goes. He starts to berate her over it and then notices that she's acting kind of strangely. You know, finally, except for that giant piece of scalp that came off. Anyways, he begins to request of her to tell him if she's sick or not. Then she gets up and immediately attacks him, scratching him in the face. Wade is outside at this point and looks over and sees Clint and Lucy hitting it off, and he must quite literally have blinders on because as he's focusing on that, Dink immediately begins running around scratching as many children as possible. Another teacher spots him doing this and then goes over to the little boy that was scratched, to which he gets immediately attacked moments later. Another teacher then runs over to pull the kids off of him as his guts hang out and a horde has amassed around him, to which he figures this out a little too late that the kids are changing. She is then attacked and torn apart as well. Inside the van is the crossing guard. He just ate a bunch of shrooms and as a result, he doesn't know if he can really trust what he's seeing. He radios to the vice principal, who's acting as principal, who has mentioned that several times in the movie, and just another reason to hate him, he's going through everyone's phone, and he says that he is watching students eat teachers, but he's on a new medication, so he doesn't know if what he's seeing is real or not. The vice principal checks out and then heads outside to confront the children, which if you're watching a bunch of kids eat teachers, why you would confront them is beyond me. As he begins asking who is everyone's homeroom teacher, they grab his arms and legs and then pin him down. They immediately tear into his abdomen and then pull off his arm. All the while, Wade is still out there on the side playing basketball. He then finally notices and turns around to all the bloodthirsty kids surrounding them. He begins to talk to them, saying that he wanted to do that to the vice principal as well, but you can't just go around eating your teachers. Seeing that he's losing ground and time, he then takes off clotheslining children and shoulder checking them into the ground before finally making it inside and then shutting the door. Possibly one of my favorite parts of the movie, as Clinton and Lucy continue talking, Doug then walks in, pointing to the outside, saying, Oh look, carnage. As the kids continue to rip apart teachers and feast, the teachers are all alerted as to what's happening on the outside as Tracy calls the police. In the middle of his report, the phone lines are ripped out by the now infected Patriot who broke into the principal's office and took out the secretary in the process. This has now rendered the teachers completely cut off and he also goes on to destroy all the cell phones in the office. Eventually, a cop does show up referring to himself as like Batman while the children drenched in blood ravenously claw at the fence. Talk about situational awareness. He puts his hands in and then immediately gets a few fingers bitten off. He goes back into his car where he's attacked by patient Zero who's waiting in the back. Then she pretty much eats him. Back inside, the teachers follow Wade's lead and decide to make a run for it. As they move through, another teacher proclaims... <laughs> another teacher proclaims that he does CrossFit and for them to follow him, and as he exits the door, he pretty much gets ripped apart immediately. Good God, I love this movie. Seriously, it's absolutely worth a watch just for the humor. Anyhow, they double back at this point as Patriot let in a lot of other kids at another door. As they argue in the classroom what to do, they eventually find a little boy named Calvin who isn't infected. It comes out that Clint was scratched earlier, however, and now is having abdominal pain. They immediately quarantine him in an effort to stop whatever is happening from spreading. As the hours pass, eventually Doug goes in and checks Clint's fluids with the two old oldest scientific tools man has, his bare hands. He determines that Clint is really just suffering from a bout of what appears to be like the stomach flu, which may be the reason that he's subbing for the original teacher. They decide to keep him in there until about 3 p.m. As Lucy mentions, that's when the parents will come back for their kids and then they can get help. As three rolls around, they let Clint out and then all head out to the balcony outside to wave down a parent who has arrived early to open the gates. Unfortunately, she is distracted by PTA stuff and doesn't know that the infected offspring she has is in her car. It infects the baby baby first and then attacks the mom, ending her in the process, so no help is coming. As they stand there, a girl who isn't infected climbs up who is hiding in a tree from all the other children, to which they are now alerted and they begin climbing up there as it's accessible. This forces the teachers to flee their classroom. They all run towards the auditorium as the kids are hot on their tails. Eventually, Dink does catch up to Clint and grabs him, dragging him to the ground. Wade bashes in the old brain case with a fire extinguisher, freeing Clint in the process, and Doug begins to look at the kids, saying he wants to dissect him. Lucy goes to the kids, telling them that they are safe, 
safe because nobody was bit or scratched, to which the girl remarks that she has been scratched. Lucy says then go into the bathroom to wash it out so it doesn't get infected, but then braces the door. Doug begins his dissection in the boys' bathroom at this point and attempts to remove the brain to see what is happening. As he is doing it, Lucy and Wade talk about their failing relationship. Not really an important point, but this is like the only serious point in this movie, to which it's then ruined by Wade telling her to go F herself and it made me laugh. Doug concludes his dissection of Dink and then brings out the brain, placing it on the floor. As he shows the brain, the frontal lobe has been completely necrosed. However, the back portions of the brain still seem somewhat alive, or they were somewhat alive, and now it's out of the skull. He goes on to say that the brain damage has caused the kids to become monsters. He hypothesizes that due to the brain being actively infected, this rules out bacteria as it cannot get past the blood-brain barrier. A virus, however, can. He concludes it's a type of virus attacking the body, but for adults, it's much more mild, so puberty must have something to do with it. To confirm this hypothesis, he knocks on the door of the girl's bathroom and asks the girl if she's experienced um, womanhood yet, to which she basically confirms she has, which solidifies his point. Only kids can be infected. And you know we will be breaking that all down because again, I'm incredibly impressed with how much science, like actual certifiable biology, is in this movie. After determining it's safe for the girl to come out, the lights are shut off by Patriot and it's discovered that Calvin is having a sugar crash as he's diabetic. To make sure he doesn't go into like a diabetic shock, they have to get sugar for him quick. As they discuss what to do, the janitor, Mr. Hitachi, bursts in and brings the teachers and the students to where he's been living underneath the school. They ask if he has food, but all he has is seaweed. They realize that they must move through the air vents at this point to get to a vending machine. As they move through, children are still patrolling around aimlessly doing what they would have been doing if they weren't infected, but eventually Lucy and Clint are able to make it to a vending machine. Lucy finds that all the phones have been destroyed and then retreats back into the air vent. As Clint tries to get food, the children spot him and they are discovered when Clint's dollar is ejected. They let out an ear-piercing scream and then are chased into the air vents. They throw the food towards the vent that they had just gone through, getting the candy bar to Calvin, and then they get out just in time to block the kids in as Lucy and Clint are stranded in a room with a half-eaten teacher. As time passes, they continue to discuss what they should do with the other teachers via radio as it looks pretty hopeless. They talk about wishing that they had some wine and that the kids undoubtedly brought in, considering they're absolute hellions, or at least they should take some of the Adderall, which then gives Clint an idea. He throws a ton of Adderall at the kids and quickly shuts the door. The kids grab it hungry hungry hippo style, and the rest of the teachers figure out that they're going to have to escape via Wade's truck. They grab anything they can to defend themselves and get ready to head out. Clint then checks on the kids after a while later and determines that yes, they have in fact OD'd on their Adderall. The teachers then meet back up and they begin taking kids out that run at them. They move outside where it becomes a massive brawl of teachers against students, which here's a good question for you. How many first graders do you think you could fist fight in waves with a fifth grader boss every 10 waves? Personally, I think I could go about 60 waves before getting tired, so leave how many you think you could do in the comments. So as they fight, eventually Wade gets left behind and sacrifices himself so that the others could escape. The teachers escape Fort Chicken and begin evacuating towards the next town, Danville. As they are driving, they realize that Patriot is still in the car. They fling him off and as he turns around, he reveals that his jaw has been ripped off due to being hit so hard. Clint then slams the car in reverse and then hits him, smashing him against a tree, taking him out in the process. As they enter Danville, it's not much better. It's clear that the town has suffered the same fate with it being completely abandoned or overrun. As they watch TVs inside of a store, they find out that this has gone a lot further than they thought. Many cities are burning all over the area, showing this virus is no longer contained. While they do, a bunch of kids then slowly creep up on them and corner them. They escape to a building, but lo and behold, it's like a literal funland for children. The lights cut on, revealing that they are surrounded by kids. Before they can break out, Wade then shows up, presumably saved by Mr. Hitachi, and rams down the door, freeing the teachers and lighting the building up and children on fire. That's a really messed up statement. He douses everything in gasoline and lights it. At the end, they take off in the car with Wade remarking that he always knows how to find his dual rear wheel drive. And I'm surprised I can say that because he messes it up like a hundred times in the movie, which then messed me up. But Clint remarks that they will go to an area that kids don't want to go, so I'm assuming probably like a library. But for now, we don't know because there hasn't been a part two. And honestly, I hope it doesn't exist because Zombieland 1 was baller. Zombieland 2 was a travesty. Again, if you haven't seen the movie, it's like one of those that you watch during the summer because it's 2 p.m. in July. It's like way too hot to go outside. And then it just turns out to be an absolute banger. I would highly recommend seeing it if you haven't. It's definitely worth a few laughs for sure. But all right, so first things first that I would like to discuss is what exactly is the disease we are dealing with here? Well, to me, I have to agree with Doug. Due to the immune system response that we see and the neuroinflammation, this rules out bacteria or fungi as these cannot get past the blood-brain barrier unless they move into the spinal fluid concerning fungi and also bacteria, but that usually doesn't happen that much. That said, a virus is a perfect candidate as it's small enough to pass through these tiny spaces and enter the neural tissue directly. The specific immune 
immune response we are seeing leading to the necrosis in this neural tissue would likely be in some ways inflammation of the meninges that surround the brain. These in turn would put pressure on the brain leading to the expiration of brain cells. Now this immune response can exist for a couple of reasons such as an actual infection in the brain or surrounding tissues becoming inflamed. I believe it's a dual prong issue for the children however. The first is this pressure from the meninges but also the actual virus has entered the brain and is infecting the neural tissue. The question is what sort of virus can actually enter and live within the nervous tissue or for that matter what virus has a propensity towards entering this tissue? Well if it isn't humanity's oldest forced companion that likely we picked up from chimpanzees when we were entering our Australopithecus stage, herpes. Yes herpes by far is one of the most seedy of viruses because of its ability to go dormant for a long time and then pop back up at random. Likely herpes simplex virus 1 which is historically responsible for cold sores but be aware it can also go other places is usually less aggressive for a lot of people and it really results in about one outbreak and then usually just spreads by shedding after that. Herpes simplex virus 2 however is harder to control and more aggressive and is responsible for symptoms usually further south on the human body but this is the specific strain that we think came from chimpanzees that jumped to humanity. This jumping is quite important actually as it shows it's adaptable. However I'm not suggesting that these kids are really infected with this disease but more or less a virus in that family. Usually it's fairly common for humans to get chicken pox as a kid. In fact it's encouraged or at least it was before the vaccine came out because getting it as an adult can actually be lethal. So getting it as a kid would result in blisters on the skin, a fever, and muscle aches. After a few days those sores would heal and as the body creates antibodies to the virus this would result in that lag time there actually resulting in chicken pox and then you clear it. So right now it's in your nervous system silently waiting until you get older to create something known as shingles which is actually like a painful burning sore that takes a while to heal. I had this one time on my back. Wouldn't recommend it. It's pretty annoying. Anyways now that they have a vaccine for chicken pox that literally came out three years after I got chicken pox there's really no need to worry about it. All that said though there is another family member within this group because ironically chickens don't get chicken pox. Humans do. In this herpes virus family however exists another form of pox known as foul pox. Foul pox has a different effect on chickens than say chicken pox on humans. It results in a general malaise that can affect their ability to lay eggs and in some instances it can lead to a chicken being smaller than average if it happens during a time when the chicken is growing. Now there's also a lot of other symptoms associated but we'll kind of avoid those for now. But foul pox can be transferred from chicken to chicken by things like skin abrasions and interactions. But insects have also been known to serve as vectors for this disease, spreading it from chicken to chicken. Sort of like that fly we saw at the beginning of the movie that excreted on the chicken's flesh. Now that chicken had really already met its end but there's no reason to suggest why that fly didn't infect living chickens. With foul pox entering a chicken's body, considering most herpes viruses live within the nervous system, so too would it make a beeline for the nerves. Here it would lay in wait. As the chicken nuggets were made, nothing is really sacred. Most of the chicken is liquefied, spreading this disease amongst multiple batches of meat. In some chicken nuggets, that dose would be higher like with the little girl and what she ate, but now a bit of reality though. Cooking and deep frying chicken nuggets would destroy the virus, but that's all predicated on cooking time. If you undercook the chicken by even just a little bit, the virus would be able to survive the process. I and mean, freezing it would preserve it, sort of like what we see with the 30,000 year old megaviruses that they're pulling out of the permafrost in Siberia. And then a quick deep fry to reheat it wouldn't be enough time to completely destroy the virus, thus leading to the outbreak that we see. And due to the exposure the foul pox has had with humans, as say with those caretakers to the chickens as they grow, likely this jump to humans isn't as difficult as you might imagine. Possibly being even passed back and forth between human to chicken, eventually it would become familiar enough with the human cellular markers to infect these cells. And really, viruses do this all the time. SIV jumped from apes to humans where it became HIV, swine flu jumped from pigs to humans, and even the current virus that we are dealing with right now jumped from bats to humans. Basically, that's life. It's not all that uncommon to just have a virus adapt this way. So as foul pox became more and more adept at infecting humans, the issue is humans typically do not like their nervous system being infected. These cells are known as something called immune privileged and typically won't be attacked by the body because of how integral they are to everything running correctly. So with a virus inside of this particular cell, it's not likely to be destroyed in a retaliatory measure, meaning that once it did infect the little girl, her body would start displaying symptoms knowing it was under attack, but the main source couldn't be attacked. So what exactly is the pathway for the virus and how does this result in such a drastic difference between adults and children who have been infected? Concerning pathway, the timing is a little weird. Obviously incubation period would take way longer than just a few seconds to minutes to actually start having an immune response, but it seems to 
get quicker the more generations of people infected. With the little girl, it took several hours for her to actually become a bloodthirsty monster. Concerning Patriot, it took about an hour, although this will be explained later. As the viral load continued to grow and mutate, becoming more familiar with human genetic coding within her, attacking Dink caused it to be effective within minutes. As he ran around and infected kids, literal seconds up to about one minute was all that was needed. This part is a little far-fetched, but concerning the little girl and her incubation time, this is more likely. As her body was infected, the virus would move through the stomach lining specifically into her and into the nervous system as well as bloodstream. Once in the bloodstream, it would then move to the Mac Daddy area where all the cool nerves are housed, the brain. Moving past the blood-brain barrier, it would immediately begin multiplying within the neurons, bursting them as the viral load increased, infecting more brain cells down the line. Eventually, the body would catch a whiff of this invader and likely go into full panic mode. When a virus infects your meat suit and is winning the battle, eventually a nuclear option is enabled. This is not the best option, but there's a reason, albeit it usually just results in the expiration of the host rather than just the disease. It is known as a cytokine storm. These cytokines go out and trigger your inflammation response to the extreme. When it does this, tissue will swell in an effort to destroy all of the invaders. Upon doing so, tissue can be damaged or destroyed entirely. This may be why we actually see the little girl kind of easily falling apart. As the cytokine storm ramps up, connection points within the skin begin to break down and be lost. Appearing as blisters in some locations, these are likely weak points and could be easily damaged. It is also possible that the virus is currently destroying skin cells as well, and as it does this, this is a battleground for the immune system which results in blisters and pus to form. And this is what results in kind of her overall appearance. Another area that is shown in the movie is the fact that they have labored breathing. Due to the inflammation phase, the bronchial tubes of the lungs would inflame, which are the same as any other tissue. And this creates the breathing issues we can hear, as well as the laboring of that sound. In the brain specifically, however, this is a crucial problem. This is what leads to the swelling of the meninges. When these swell, as mentioned, this puts pressure on the brain, destroying large portions of it in the process. In the little girl, likely this was already happening, but specifically, let's talk about Dink for a moment. As he fell to this disease, it would appear that the frontal lobe associated with rational thought and impulse control was the first to be destroyed. This would turn him into the animalistic infected that we see as he's operating in a state of brain damage, which is known to cause aggression in people. Becoming aggressive, he would then lash out, but likely another part of his brain was being afflicted, and this is the lower portion, such as the hypothalamus. With this area likely damaged, it may be inducing an extreme feeling of hunger. With his rational brain gone, as well as impulse control, he's operating purely on instincts at this point, and hunger is making him feel like he's starving. This leads him, in turn, to become more aggressive in his response, as he is an animal after all, and to this hunger accompanied by brain damage. You truly will eat anything if you are hungry enough, and that's exactly what the infected children are doing. As more and more children are infected, they become ravenous towards adults who are not infected, but even in this state, they still do things like normal children do, as in play and repeat patterns, such as heading into the car or riding a tricycle. This play is actually an instinct, if you didn't know, and this is a much more lower portion of the brain than, say, like the primate section. And patterns is something our brain just does in general, which may explain why the one child ran towards his mom's car like usual as she pulled up. It's something he just always did, so even infected, his brain went through the motions. So after talking to Wow Such Gaming yesterday, he also mentioned how is it possible that these kids are still able to move despite such egregious brain damage. Again, going back to Dink, after his dissection, Doug puts the brain on the ground. If you look closely and for like half a second, you can actually see where the brain damage is on the frontal lobe ends and the living tissue being around mid parietal lobe. The cerebellum appears to be entirely intact at the back of the head, meaning that movement and motion for the time being are still completely viable. This is also why he can still breathe, still feel hunger, and still have a heartbeat because the medulla oblongata as well as lower portions of the brain are likely still functional. Now I can hear you already. You're saying, but Roanoke, why would the virus target a specific portion of the brain? Why would it not infect all of it? And for that matter, why would the cytokine storm not completely activate all the meninges inflammation? Well, for that, I would turn you back towards what the herpes virus actually does. It targets specific neurons, whether they be in your head or in your lower spine. It infects these cells and expresses at seemingly random times, or should they be under stress and triggered? It wouldn't be too crazy to think that the foul pox, for some reason or another, would target the neurons of the frontal lobe more readily than other 
areas. It may just be responding to the rapid growth of frontal lobe tissue that children undergo as they grow. Usually this takes place between about the ages of three to six, but continue to grow in size and develop as the child heads towards puberty. I believe this growth of tissue is like a beacon to the virus as it enters the brain, afflicting this area more heavily, but likely still infecting other portions of the brain as well. As for the cytokine storm, this would likely inflame the meninges, but this is going to take time. We will get to the expiration of kids here in a minute, which is also a pretty messed up sentence. So the question remains now that we have a pretty good grasp on what the virus does and how it interacts with the kid's meat suit, why doesn't it affect adults in the same way? Well, a generalized explanation is half given in the movie by my boy Doug, but he is cut off mid-sentence. But you know Papa Roanoke is here to drop that sweet science information on you. You remember being a kid, right? Didn't it seem like you would always just get sick out of nowhere all the time? You'd just be hanging out and suddenly you went home, you felt like crap. It's likely a distant memory, but as you got older, all of a sudden your immune system became more adept at dealing with infections. You felt less worse too, even when you did get sick. Like you could kind of just power through and you would rest when you had to rest, but you could definitely get through the day. Was it the vaccines? Did you catch everything and it made you stronger as a result? Well, likely if you are watching this, the vaccines kind of kept you alive from the real dangerous stuff. Like for instance, measles has the ability to completely wipe out your immune system's memory concerning what it's already fought as your body literally throws every T cell and B cell it has at it, which is why children are actually more likely to expire roughly five years after contracting measles because of any normal disease has caught them during this weakened state. But I can assure you though, you haven't caught everything to make you resistant. Colds and viruses mutate every year, making it a brand new enemy for your body to fight. So why do illnesses seem less severe as you get older up to a certain degree? Because then when you get really old, uh, it gets pretty bad. Well, puberty for one thing is a big reason as to why you don't react terribly to an illness like you once did. Children and adults are not the same. Children are not just tiny adults and adults aren't just big children. Our bodies undergo changes through puberty, almost completely separating us from those parts of life. When a child gets sick, what happens is due to the steroid hormones or testosterone, estrogen, as well as progesterone being lower in the body, inflammation happens more readily. The body reacts more aggressively to diseases, making you feel sicker in the process. When adults after puberty or currently undergoing puberty get sick, these steroid hormones have a profound impact that can literally override the feeling of being sick as the body's response is stifled somewhat. In fact, that's the whole reason any of us are actually here. I bet you've heard of something called man flu, haven't you? Men get a bad rap for being big babies when we're actually sick, whereas women are less likely to complain about being sick. Well, look no further than at the hormones of the body. For women to actually become pregnant during the action of fertilization, the immune system must be more subdued in a woman as if she had the response to foreign cells like a male did, then likely nobody would ever get born. But estrogen and progesterone that she has causes the immune system to not as readily attack sperm cells, allowing them to actually get to an egg. Men lack as high estrogen and progesterone. So with higher testosterone, it's still a steroid hormone, but not as adept at subduing the immune system, which means we may actually experience the feeling of sickness more heavily than our female counterparts do. Pretty interesting, huh? I believe this is the entire point of the sickness in this movie. Again, Doug mentions it to a degree, but the sex hormones that are ramped up during puberty are integral for who displays mind-damaging sickness versus a stomach flu, and ironically, it has an opposite effect that chickenpox does. In adults, chickenpox can be lethal, but in children, it rarely is. When adults are infected, the first thing they usually feel is abdominal pain, interestingly enough, which is exactly what an adult feels in cooties. Children, however, with the chickenpox, have a response, but are usually more subdued. Possibly in the foul pox, however, the reverse and possibly some overlap are there. The abdominal pain is there in adults, but due to high amount of steroid hormones that they have, they're able to resist the levels of response, leading to literal brain damage. Whereas the children who have not experienced puberty will still be fully infected. Everyone has the same virus, it's just how your body responds to it. And this is why the girl who was infected but had undergone puberty, while not an adult, she had the hormones in high enough levels to bypass the cytokine storm that afflicted the younger kids. This may also be why Patriot is still somewhat in control and appears to be thinking whereas the other kids are just acting on pure instinct. It is mentioned that Patriot was held back a grade and didn't go on with his peers. Considering he's bigger than the rest of the kid and appears to be acting more aggressive right out of the gate, likely he is entering puberty but still does not possess enough of the hormones. This threshold within the male population may come down to how much testosterone you have means if you exhibit really bad symptoms. Adult males do not exhibit symptoms but may need more testosterone than a female needs estrogen or progesterone. And this explains why the girl, even though she may be the same age as Patriot, is able to resist the worst effects of the infection, whereas Patriot just doesn't have enough testosterone to get him over that 
that threshold. However, it's not an all or nothing deal. With him having some elevated levels of testosterone, he's able to bypass the more damaging effects that leads to his peers becoming more mindless, and he keeps the ability to plan slightly as seen when he opens doors, rips out phone cords, or shuts down the power. He was kind of a jerk when he was uninfected, so now that he's infected, he's just barely under the abdominal pain line, and he continues to be a jerk, but is now hungry and angry, but also still possesses some of his frontal lobe. So let's talk about if these kids are actually going to survive. With the brain damage already seen in Dink within just a couple hours, you could expect all of these kids to be brain dead within about two days. Possibly a little bit longer could be afforded to the kids who were near puberty, but any child over puberty, as we have seen, will be okay. But if you are below the puberty line, that is literally an entire generation lost because this could be game over. But overall, again, you got to watch this movie. It was hilarious and actually fairly well thought out premise. It's a shame it didn't do as well as it could have, but if you just go in expecting a fun story, I'd say it definitely succeeded in that.